I didn't see Masataka yet. Not sure if he's wrong. Does he know what the time zone is? Oh, there he is. I think you you know. Hi, hi. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, welcome. So uh, I make you co-host. Uh, ah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, give give me a second. Give me a second. Give me a second. Uh, I I need to. Uh, yeah. Right. Everything's good. I need to connect my iPad, I think. Now, now, now you are in Israel? Yes, yes. Uh, are you OK? I'm OK, I'm OK. But uh, you might hear, uh, you might hear uh, alarms during the talk. Just, I'll, I'll move to the shelter when this happens. And I can I can talk from there. Uh, uh, I I hope you don't get the bomb during <laughs> your talk. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, okay. Okay. Ah, uh, sorry. Sorry, the internet is slow, and I can't uh, I can't move my uh, uh, PDF to my iPad. Sorry. Nah. Masataka, you say yes. you have another account, right? But I haven't find find is is already on the online already or it's not? What what what, want, what again? Sorry. Do you want to have another account login, or you just want to use? Yes, one? yes, yes, yes. Just a second, just a second. I, my internet is really slow, and I can't. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Here it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now it's good. Okay. Push. Sorry. Like, uh, is it locked in? Uh, am, I, am I? Yes. Great. Okay. Just, just one second. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yellow is also co host. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to send my PDF to my iPad, but it never. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Just, just one minute. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, I think people might slowly join in. So you. Okay. It's totally fine. And if you, if you need more time after twelve, you know you can you can still keep finish what you're saying. So not not a, not really a strictly constraint on the time. I see. Oh. 
o no. Okay, okay, it should do, it should do. I can't believe this internet. It's also possible you can share your PDF to me. Yeah. I can, I, I can oh. screen share and you just tell me next slide, next slide. I can <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I really wanted to write something on it. Uh, that's why I wanted to. Sorry, 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 sorry. Oh. Okay. Fine, fine. Okay. I, I think I'll, I'll just uh, connect my uh, connect from my computer, and then uh, if I need something to write, uh, I'll uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll do it on my. Uh... Sorry, I should have bought a better computer. Yeah. No. Uh, okay, basically I'm ready. Basically, I'll, I'll try yeah. one more time. Yeah. Sure, screen, please. Okay. Yeah. Is that so? How do, how do I? Uh, how do I share screen? Uh, uh, ah, yeah, yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, right, 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 right. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Ready? Oh, yeah, I'm ready. I'm sorry. I'm Uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to Hover CMSA seminar on quantum matter in math and physics. Yoko so minasan. And I should also say, Yoshi Nishio. Ohayo gozaimasu. Konnichiwa. Konbanwa. Good day and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Today we are very honored to have uh, Masataka Watanabe from Weizmann Institute of Science. Uh, he will be speaking his recent work on boundary anomaly and entanglement. And let's mm -hmm. welcome uh, Masataka, please. Yes. Eh. Okay. Uh, just a second. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about boundary anomaly and entanglement. And uh, uh, this is based on the recent paper with Simon Hellerman and Dominic Orlando. Uh, so uh, what's it about? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna talk about quantum information theory. Uh, just a second, because of this, I can't see. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hmm. Uh. Is, so, sorry, Be, because of the thing that's appearing. Uh, okay, great. Okay, I can move it. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry. I'm gonna talk about quantum information theory and quantum gravity. Uh, quantum information theory is very important in understanding quantum gravity. And one example is the Ritukanagi formula. The, the von Neumann entropy, entanglement entropy is dual to the area of the extremal surface of the dual, block, uh, dual uh, quantum gravity. And the other example, is that the one version of the black hole information paradox is formulated using the entanglement entropy. So 
Um, the question is, the, does any variant of the entanglement entropy gives us consistency condition uh, for the UV complete gravity? And so like Bootstrap has been trying to trying or succeeding to do. Um, and I think for that for nomen entropy, the answer might be negative because the island computation is all semi-classical and yet um, it uh, produces the um, correct form of the um, for nomen ent entanglement entropy for the radi radiation. Okay, good. Um, so it's time to take a step back. Before discussing interesting stuff about quantum gravity, I think it's a good idea to understand the entanglement entropy better in QFT. So, so uh, the definition of entanglement entropy requires the three, uh, tensor factorization of the Q, QFT Hilbert space, like this H total Hilbert space is HA tensor, HA bar, HA complement. And uh, what's the meaning of this is in continuum theories. It doesn't, uh, it obviously doesn't exist in continuum theories. So what's the meaning of this? So there is no such thing as a bare tensor factorization in continuum Q of Ts, uh, which, which goes like H total is HA tensor, uh, tensor product, uh, HA bar. So obviously one needs to suitably regularize the theory. And the regularization should be compatible with locality so um, the operator algebra on the Hilbert space A is still supported on region A, okay? And so be warned that this is richer information than just tensor factorization in linear algebra sense because of the notion of locality. I mean, any Hilbert space um, has a tensor factorization if you forget about locality, but since we're talking about local uh, operator algebra on each space, uh, uh, this, this is much, more, much richer information uh, about physics. Okay, so, so one can do a very convenient regularization called the lattice regularization if you want to hill, uh, tensor factorize the um, Hilbert spaces. Uh, this might sound counterintuitive, but, the, but it also works for gauge theories. Uh, gauge, gauge fields live on the link and the uh, matter live on the uh, uh, dots. So it's non-trivial how to factorize the Hilbert space, but, uh, and for instance, uh, in fact, Wilson lines going through the boundary causes a problem. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, I want to write something, but I can't. Yeah. Uh, is there any way I can? I can. I can. Ah. Oh. Okay. Great. Can you actually see this? It's much better, right? Yes. Great, great, great. Sorry, sorry. Okay, it's much better then. Okay. So, 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 yeah. For instance, Wilson lines going through the boundary causes a problem. I, I mean, so you have uh, space A, uh, spatial slice A and A bar, and it, if the Wilson line going through the boundary, uh, the, the state like this cannot be um, uh, trivially um, uh, factorized. But one can modify the theory slightly in the UV. Uh, but so that it flows to the same theory in the IR to define factorization. So for example, uh, add a charged heavy field on the boundary so that the Wilson lines can end on the boundary. This is how you um, uh, amend gauge theories to support uh, tensor factorization of Hilbert space. But the lattice regularization does not always exist, okay? Uh, this is known as the Nielsen Dinomia theorem I mean, the lattice construction with local interaction and finite entropy per site. Uh, so this rules out domain wall fermions and the constructions like that uh, using higher dimensional physics. Anyway, the, the statement of nielsen nomia theorem is that the 2D version, uh, sorry, the 2D nielsen nomia theorem is that there is no lattice construction of a free chiral fermion because of the doubling problem. The main question, uh, of this talk is if there always exists such regularization allowing for the tensor factorization of the Hilbert space like this, uh, irrespective of lattice regularization or other regularizations whatsoever. Okay. Uh, any, any, any questions or too trivial? Okay. Sorry, okay. Um, now, uh, excuse me. So now you already, you have fermions, so you, you want to have a, a Z2 graded Hilbert space mm -hmm. in the sense of the Bosonian fermionic sectors. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so okay. okay, okay, again, yeah, again, uh, again, yeah, it, you're right. Uh, you, you you want to ask if if uh, I, I say your discussion is something you you will apply also to fermionic system, right? Just right, right. Sure. Fermionic systems too. Fermionic systems too. A anything. Uh, it, it can be boson. It can be fermion. It can be whatsoever. Okay. Right. Uh, right. So, so yeah, yeah. You might have a comment about that later on. So, um, yeah. So, so, uh, uh, yeah. Maybe later you might have a comment about it. Okay. Anyway, so the summary result. Uh, results of this talk is that point one, the concept of tensor factorization and hence the co concept of entanglement entropy is still defined for two DCFDs with a gravitational anomaly, uh, by which I mean C, uh, the chiral central charge, uh, uh, CL minus CR is not equal to zero. They're not equal. If they're not equal, uh, uh, the theory, the CFT has a gravitational anomaly. And the point two is that even when there is a tensor factorization, uh, in, in particular when CL is equal to CR, the way one can do the tensor factorization is in general non-unique. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to argue that it's related to um, uh, the concept of uh, lattice or the concept of boundary of a, of a, of a given, uh, given theory and its relation to an anomaly. So, so I want to I want to prove point one: the concept of tensor factorization and hence the entanglement entropy is still defined in two D CFTs with a gravitational anomaly. I want to use the contrapositive statement, uh, contrapositive, uh, to prove the result. Okay. So we prove by contradiction that uh, the non-vanishing gravitational anomaly leads to the absence of tensor factorization in two D. Okay. Uh, so. So it's, it's proof by contradiction. So assume there is a Hilbert space factorization like this. H total is H A tensor H A, uh, a complement. In other words, one can define the partial trace. Uh, so starting from the theory on a full line with Hamiltonian H, we will show that partial trace gets us, gets us the same theory with the same Hamiltonian defined on the half line. So uh, you, you should imagine A being here, A bar being here. Uh, I will call the direction X. So A is X greater than zero. So uh, I will define the Hamiltonian A defined on X greater than zero. So one essentially wants to do, what, what one essentially wants to do is to take the partial trace like this. So trace B of, if we, if we could just do it, it's simply the, um, Hamiltonian defined on the half line, uh, as also hx is equal to h of x. So uh, this is what we want. But uh, obviously, trace b of one is infinite. Tra uh, partial trace over, uh, sorry, I mean a, a bar. Partial trace over h is also infinite. I mean, so, so this doesn't make sense. So you need to regularize the theory. By the way, if you have the lattice regularization, uh, such an operation is trivial. Because interaction is local, uh, lattice constant A, I mean, imagine something like this. And uh, this is region A, this is region A bar. And I'm trying to say that trace A bar of over this is well defined, right? It's uh, finite over finite. And uh, the interaction is local. So uh, the lattice constant A, a, I mean, the lattice constant A, H A is only different from H, the full Hamiltonian uh, close to the boundary, right? It, it, it's just because interaction is local. Uh, so for example, if you um, imagine uh, the nearest neighbor interaction, uh, the, the H A is only different from H, uh, very, uh, one, step near, uh, one step next to the boundary, uh, from the full Hilbert, uh, full Hamiltonian H, right? So if you take the IR limit, which means A goes to zero, we have um, H A of X is equal to H of X for the region A, in, in region A. And the question is if we can prove this without assuming such non-generic regularizations. So if you have lattice regularization, the result is very um, uh, trivial, but the question is, um, do, uh, can we do it for generic regularizations? Okay. So, 
So we can use heat kernel regularization. Um, um, <clears throat> so, so heat kernel regularization is, is defined like this. Uh, so replace one with exponential minus epsilon h and take epsilon to zero in the end. But, uh, and because we're using the intrinsic data of the CFT, it's a well-defined uh, operation, generic operation uh, suitable to any CFTs. Um, or we can also use a slightly different regularization like this, which is the- uh, Sorry, sorry. Yes, <laughs> yes. Epsilon is uh, beta? Yes, uh, temperature, uh, yeah, uh, universal okay. temperature. Uh, okay, okay. Yes. Uh, so we can also use a slightly different regularization, which is defined like this. But if you you can you can actually um, uh, expand the expand in the, each order in epsilon to see that there, these two are the same at each order in epsilon. The mo modulo coefficients and the locality properties of them are the same. And we focus on the second one because this is this is a convenient name in quantum information theory it's called the high temperature modular hamiltonian uh, so 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 uh, it's it's convenient in quantum information theory and uh, we focused on the second definition of the regularization okay okay and anyway again the high temperature modular hamiltonian is defined using this equation, exponential of minus h of the modular Hamiltonian is equal to the partial trace of exponential minus epsilon h, okay? And, uh, uh, and the h is defined uh, using a, a time evolution or a local operator like this, okay? Uh, an Euclidean time evolution, of course. Uh, and taking the partial trace for, uh, uh, taking the partial trace, we should have, this relation because, um, eh, what should I say? Uh, eh, for, for, for X greater than order epsilon, uh, obviously um, taking the positive trace does not affect O. So um, you will end up, just end up with the, uh, uh, you, you will use this definition to end up with this uh, uh, equation in the end. So this means that the, um, a, the modular Hamiltonian um, creates the same uh, Euclidean time evolution as the original Hamiltonian defined in the full space for a operator on uh, operator living on x greater than order epsilon. Or I, I mean, so this is a a bar, and this is x is equal to zero, and this is uh, order epsilon. Okay. So, so uh, why did I have the buffer of order epsilon? Is that the uh, taking the partial trace affects the physics? Uh, I mean, but, but we, we have the Euclidean time evolution, and if it affects the physics near the boundary, but uh, only so much, only only so much as order epsilon, right? Because we use the locality of the trace. Um, the fact that any effect on local operations will be damped distance epsilon away from the insertion after propagating Euclidean time epsilon. So it, it, although it's a Euclidean time, uh, Euclidean propagation, uh, such an operation done on x is equal to zero does not, does not really um, affect distance, if, if you're distance epsilon away from the insertion. So, so you have this um, um, uh, equation, which means that the, um, the high temperature modular Hamiltonian is almost the same as the original Hamiltonian, only uh, for x greater than, uh, away, uh, away from the boundary at a uh, distance epsilon, okay? Uh, does every, do everyone, does everyone follow? Okay. Okay, anyway, so after all, we would like to take epsilon to zero. We would like to take the uh, continuum limit. And uh, then we have for x greater than zero, h a of x is equal to h of x, right? h a epsilon x was equal to h of x for, oh, um, for x greater than order epsilon. So by taking epsilon to zero, uh, obviously we'll have this relation, but the only difference of h a 
an H X, a H of X and H X is at the boundary, X is equal to zero. And in general, we expect boundary relevant operators when taking epsilon goes to zero because the coefficients of the boundary um, relevant operators scales as epsilon to the dimension minus one, right? One has to integrate over dt to get the action. So this is uh, how the coefficient scales. And so in particular, when delta is equal to zero, I mean, the, for the cosmological constant, uh, it gets larger and larger as you take epsilon uh, goes to zero. But the boundary RG flow has never been proven. Uh, I mean, but the, you can run the boundary RG flow. Um, it's never been proven to terminate, unlike its bulk counterpart, which is the C theorem. Um, but I think it's perfectly fair to assume this for generic theories that the boundary RG flow uh, terminates at some point. And it's called the uh, freedom connection hypothesis. So we rely heavily on this, that the, uh, the boundary uh, condition flows to a conformal boundary condition. But then anyway, we will then end up with the same theory defined on the half line with a conformal boundary condition on x equal to zero. So what we have proven, uh, what we have proven is that the, by, 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 uh, by defining an object like this, Uh, we can suitably take the epsilon goes to zero limit, which is the same as h of x uh, when, uh, on the half line. Right. We have done nothing uh, very non trivial, but. May I make sure something? Yes. Let's make sure the boundary condition here, do you discuss the boundary uh, or maybe the interface between two different quantum vacua? or you are considered the same quantum vacuum, but you just have some uh, virtual card that the uh, push case it ah. is. Uh, no, uh, so, right. So uh, uh, what I mean is the, uh, it's, the, it's the type of the boundary where, where, where your theory is really uh, literally defined on the half line. So you can, uh, I think you can think of the uh, left, bound, uh, left portion to be gapped and the right portion to be, uh, Gapless. Am I right? Or something? What I mean is that the what I mean what what I mean is that the H A defined in this way is a theory living on a half line, and there is nothing else. There uh, there there is no x less than zero for for this system. So so these are, are trivially gapped. Uh, trivialing, yeah, in a sense, there's not even low energy TQFT. No, right, right. So, so it's no, so so it's a right. No, so so H is the Hamiltonian for CFT, right? H was Hamiltonian for CFT. We started from CFT, right? Uh, did I, did I, didn't I say it? Okay, uh, we started from CFT. So we started from the CFT Hamiltonian H of X. Uh, I mean, I mean. H defined like the uh, 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 integration over the local Hamiltonian density. And uh, uh, we, we defined H A of X using this operation. I mean, because we have the partial trace, we assume the existence of the partial trace. So we're happy, uh, we're, we're free, to, free to define such an object. And I'm saying that it's uh, uh, by taking epsilon to zero, H, we can show the H A, which is the, uh, again, the uh, integration of the uh, energy, uh, Hamiltonian density on the positive x greater than zero, uh, uh, HA defines a boundary CFT uh, living on the uh, x greater than zero. That's what I mean. Yes, but, but you say on one side, maybe you choose x larger than zero is CFT and yes. x smaller than there is, you say it's gapped, and I asked for ah, gap yeah, yeah, right, 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 yeah, right. Gap so, sorry, totally, gap. totally, 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 yes. Trivially yes. gapped, no low energy. Right. But how do you determine the boundary condition uh, or the, the interface condition? It seems you didn't, I don't know whether you specify already, but uh, it seems there could be choices or consistent con consistency condition to define such a boundary condition. Right, uh, I see, uh, I, I think, so yeah, it's all. I think it's all in the definition of the partial trace. So if you, 
Yeah, that's, that's going to be, I, I'm going to talk about it later, but if you change the definition of the partial trace slightly, you're, you're going to end up with a different boundary condition for, for this. But because I'm dealing with it in a generic way, I, you're right. We, uh, I didn't specify at all what the boundary condition looked like. But I mean, isn't that the, isn't that the point? Uh, the, the the partial trace defines a boundary. Can I mean it? Exactly. There's no additional input. If the partial trace exists, then the boundary condition is an output. You know, without further uh, further choices. Exactly. Right. Uh, so, so, so you 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 would consider the space time dimension is arbitrary or just restrict to one plus one? Let, let's restrict to one plus one dimension. Let's restrict to one plus one dimension, and then yeah. So, so yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I can I can retreat a bit, and then uh, right. So, so I mean, even in the lattice systems, uh, we can take the partial trace in a different way to uh, end up with uh, different boundary conditions. Uh, this is. Uh, for example, you can take the free boundary condition on the uh, this this boundary condition. Uh, sorry, I mean free boundary condition for the uh, Eisen model. Uh, I mean lattice Eisen model, and then you in the continuum you will end up with a free boundary condition. But you can uh, you can uh, what uh, project out the spins on the boundary near the boundary to get different boundary conditions. That's how you get the uh, spin up or spin down boundary condition of the Eisen model in the continuum. So anyway, uh, the way you take partial traces determines uh, the boundary conditions. But I haven't specified what kind of definition this partial trace is, so I haven't specified the boundary condition. Okay. And is there any reason? Can you also discuss? Other, I just wonder whether your your approach also work when the x more than zero region has uh, maybe. T Q of T low energy, low energy, like uh, we call the topological order. Does that also work? Uh, but certainly, you are discuss one plus one D, so that, that will not be a good example. But uh, yeah, if you yeah. are also going to apply to higher dimension, then the other side could also be gapped. Could be gapped, uh, but uh, topological and, and topological order. I don't know whether I, I, I just gonna... I just threw the question, but maybe you can discuss later, or, or if you have a time. Uh, yeah. Right. Okay. 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 Great. 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 Let's discuss it later. Yeah. Uh... I'll, I'll try to come up with an answer. Uh, right, so I should summarize, I guess. Uh, I, I summarized, uh, I, again, we were try, trying, to, uh, trying to prove point one, that if we have tensor factorization of the Hilbert space, uh, uh, so, sorry, <clears throat> the, the tensor factorization does not exist uh, if you have a gravitational anomaly and I wanted to prove by contradiction, so I, Assume the existence of this, the, the tensor factorization, and I'm on my way to proving that CL is equal to CL, right? And uh, by by assuming the tensor factorization, uh, the existence of the tensor factorization, pick one a, a way of doing the partial trace. Um, uh, we define the uh, boundary CFT, right? CFT living on the half line. Uh, with locally the same Hamiltonian as the original theory, okay? So mapping everything to the upper half plane, the energy conservation equation, uh, conservation, I mean, boundary conformal board identity uh, becomes like this. So uh, it's, it's your upper half plane and the energy does not flow out of the uh, region. It should not flow out of the region if you're considering the unitary uh, boundary conformal field theory. And uh, this is the boundary operator and the change in energy of the bulk is um, absorbed by the, uh, uh, the energy absorbed by the boundary operator. That's the, what the equation means. Anyway, the modular transform statement, because it's in one plus one dimensions, we can do, uh, we can do the modular transformation. And uh, we can say that there is a boundary state satisfying a ln minus L minus N bar is equal to zero. That's the famous Cardi condition for the boundary state. And this is when there are no boundary operators, but it's almost the same when there are, so we're going to discard it. Anyway, we can play with the Vera Soro algebra and then prove that the, the left, left chiral central charge is equal to the right chiral central charge. Okay, so we can prove that the 2D boundary conformal field theories always have a vanishing gravitational anomaly. CL minus CR is equal to zero.
Okay. So what have we done? We uh, we have assumed the existence of tensor factorization, and we end up with a consistent boundary conformal field theory, and then uh, it the uh, it implied the vanishing gravitational anomaly. Okay. So one can take the contrapositive of the whole process and say that uh, if you have the gravitational anomaly, there are no consistent boundary conditions, and hence this is not compatible with the existence of the partial trace. Okay. So, so um, what I'm trying to argue is that uh, if, for the 2D CFTs with non-vanishing gravitational anomaly, you can't really define the um, entanglement entropy because you can't define the reduced density matrix. Anyway, a, so one can prove the generalized Nielsen denominator theorem as a corollary. Uh, yeah, Cor corollary. I mean, any 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 theory with lattice realization can be trivially tensor factorized by taking the free boundary condition. By by free boundary condition, I mean that uh, uh, deleting all the degrees of freedom on the left hand. Uh, I mean, so a and a bar, and deleting all the degrees of freedom living on a bar. And this means that the theory with a non vanishing gravitational anomaly does not have lattice regulators. I mean, in the Nielsen denominator sense. Of course, you can again, again do domain wall fermions and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, right. So uh, if you have finite entropy per site, um, it's impossible to have a lattice, uh, lattice construction of a theory with, uh, of, of 2D CFD with a non vanishing gravitational anomaly. And this includes the original 2D Nielsen Nenemia theorem, the one chiral fermion cannot be realized on a lattice because of doubling problem, uh, because then we would have CL is equal to one over one half while CR is equal to zero. Okay. Uh, but by the way, I, I think this, um, uh, the non-existence of boundary conditions for um, gravitationally anomalous theory Theories have a very intuitive explanation if you if you consider, uh, 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 yeah. I, I mean, if you consider high uh, high energy density with states, right? Uh, so imagine CL is equal to one half and CR is equal to zero, and uh, the uh, high energy because of the Cauchy formula, the high energy density of states uh, goes like exponential C at E, right? C C L E going from left to right. But since CR is equal to zero, there is no mood coming back from it. So, uh, so, so this, this result, the boundary CFTs must have CL is equal to CR, is that the, uh, the degrees of freedom moving from left to right and the number of degrees of freedom moving from right to left must be uh, balanced in order to have the boundary condition. Yeah, excuse me. Uh, yes. I have a question. That uh, the argument you provide appear to be for the gapless one plus one D system. And uh, but if the one plus one D system have an energy gap, and uh, whether do you have a similar uh, uh, argument? Because it's no longer conformal field theory, no conformal boundary, or things, etc. Right, 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 right. Hey, but but the. If the theory were gap, then there couldn't be a gravitational anomaly to be to begin with. I mean, it it has a gap theory can't have a gravitational anomaly. Right. It's just the tough the old tough argument. So we 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 have an example of gap theory indeed have a gravitational anomaly, and so the question is that whether uh, this. This approach can detect that gravitational anomaly or not. So you in two in two dimensions, in two dimensions, theories with gravitational anomaly are never gap. Uh, yeah. in, no. in you mean in one plus one dimension? And yeah. uh, I think I have an example of a one plus one dimensional theory with a gravitational anomaly. No, no, not a not a uni, not a unitary theory. No, I mean that's it's a theorem. Maybe let me clarify the language a bit. Uh, 
I think uh, I think uh, there's another picture that the the boundary of any two plus any topology order will have a gravitational anomaly. And this boundary. Can th be this gaps. is not. This is this isn't a three D theory. This is a two D theory. I mean, so, the boundary of a two plus one is dimensional <laughs> topology order have a one plus one. Yeah. Dimensional gravitational anomaly. So that's yeah, a, of course, this is well known, but that's not what he's that's not what he's talking about. So, so okay, okay, I, I, I can <laughs> uh, uh, maybe let me clarify. I think uh, I, I think uh, uh, Simone and uh, Masataka they mean the here particularly the potential gravitational anomaly. So that's Carlson charge. Yeah, that's not zero, and yeah. uh, also potential local gravitational anomaly. And, uh, yeah, yeah, we're talking about yeah, okay, right. right. So, so these are the if you, you if you use the language of uh, this classify them by invertible topological uh, field theory in one higher dimension, this will be some three D gravitational transignment. And uh, what Xiao Gang tried to say about the gravitational norm is uh, non perturbative one, a uh, global one, but I think in two D you require possibly additional symmetry. Yeah, so, so you, you mean like means, uh, mix, 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 mix. It's, it's mixed gauge gravity type of anomaly, I think. Uh, no, no symmetry, no symmetry. There is no symmetry. Just a pure global. Indeed, I'm talking about the global uh, non perturbative gravitational but, anomaly. But, but, which but is in that case, I think. The time yeah. that theory, uh, uh, but, uh, in that, right. but in that case, uh, Xiaogang, what you mean is not even a a total anomaly captured by invertible phases. It's actually non-invertible. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's non-invertible. Yeah. It's not necessarily non-invertible. Right. Non-invertible anomaly, but I think they are restricted to invertible anomaly, and also the form they consider here is pure gravitational. So let's yeah, I, I, put- Yeah, that I totally agree. Uh, for invertible gravitational anomaly, they are totally captured by chiral central charge. Indeed. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I see. Yeah, so, so yeah, right. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention the uh, I, I I can't say anything about it, but I'm gonna mention non perturbative anomaly in uh, two slides. So uh, let me I want to hear your opinion about it. Anyway, so so by by the way, I'm, again it's slightly related to what what you said. Um, it's uh, so so the factorization we mean here again is not the factorization in the literal linear algebra sense, and one does neither have a literal uh, mathematical factorization for gauge theories. But that can be amended by modifying this theory slightly in the UV. But this is in solved to pathology we mentioned earlier of the that the um, anomalous theory does not have boundary because the anomalies are gene variant. So this procedure still does not make the, make the Hilbert space factorizable. If the original theory is anomalous. Okay. So so yeah yeah. So right. So we can talk about other symmetries or higher dimensions. And by a similar argument, one can prove that there are no boundary conditions preserving a continuous symmetry G if the symmetry G is anomalous by using a similar argument. And also we can prove that in 60 by integrating the anomaly polynomial on a 4D manifold, we can prove that the theory with non-vanishing factor as anomaly does not meet a boundary condition across a 4D surface with non-zero signature class. But I think this has been updated in Thongren, uh, the recent paper by uh, Thongren and Wong, that uh, any, any perturbative gravitational anomaly does not admit the boundary condition. So even in, uh, also in 60, the anomaly polynomial must be um, identically vanishing to uh, have a um, boundary condition. Uh, so, so also you can talk about 4D, there are only mixed anomaly uh, as, as Juven and Shaogan said. Uh, I think this is why one needs chirality in the 4D Nielsen and Lumia theorem. Um, one needs the, one also think one also has to think about the vanishing of the um, mixed anomaly to um, talk about the lattice construction or I think uh, boundary boundary conditions too. So so I said there are only mixed anomaly in 4D, but that that's just a perturbative anomaly. I think in 4D there is a pure gravitational anomaly. Uh, if you consider like uh, uh, all Fermi and electrodynamics, and I'm wondering if you can uh, build the boundary condition of such a theory. I mean, usually such a uh, all Fermi and electrodynamics is uh, realized as a boundary of 5D bulk. So if you say that boundary of a, of a boundary is uh, you know, non-existent, you can say that you might not have any boundary conditions, but I, I don't know. Uh, I'm wondering what happens there. 
Sorry, can, let me make sure. I think Ryan also here probably can say something. So uh, you are saying this, uh, the gravitational anomaly captured by 5D invertible T Q of T, uh, some, some form like W2, W3 of Yeah, yeah, right, W2, W3. Then let me just make sure when you say the boundary condition here, you are trying to construct, uh, say, uh, a 4D theory on one side, maybe gapless, and uh, on, no. on, the, on, the, on the other side, you want to have a gap, and then you try to define an interface between this gapless 4D theory and, 4D, uh, and the other 4D gap theory, the interface, a 3D interface between the two. Yes, so you, and then... Uh, and, and then, and then, because of the the this this uh, this uh, anomaly, the the W two W three gravitational anomaly, the four D gap side also need to be non trivial. It, it will it will require some Z two T Q of T and also non trivial coupling to the W two mm -hmm. term. So you want to define an interface between maybe some U uh, one gauge theory, the over mill electron dynamics on one side, and also the four D gap Z two gauge theory in the, on the other okay. side, and you will ask. Is that what you want to ask the, the 3D interface between the two? No, it's a, strong, yeah. it's a stronger question. It has to do with an interface to a trivial theory when you're talking about a boundary condition. So you, you want to, yeah, that's what I want to ask Master Taka. Are you want to, do you want to have a trivial theory on one side? Uh, trivial theory on one side. I just want to talk about the boundary condition here. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree that there's a possibility of uh, having an interface between other topological QFTs, but I don't even understand the the most trivial case where you have trivial gap, trivially gapped vacuum on one side and the other, the 4D all electron, uh, uh, all fermion uh, electrodynamics. Yeah, but, but then, because the trivial gap side, you will still want to set for the, the same anomaly, the same W2, W3 anomaly, right? Uh, so I, no, no, I, no, I, no, 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 no. No, no. In, okay, I, I'm just talking in terms of analogy. I mean, I, I'm saying that. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I see. I, I see. yeah. Okay, that's what you mean. Okay, I see. I see. Yep. No, I, I, I don't know how to prove it. I, I don't know how to prove it, so I, I, I can't say anything about it. Like it, when for, in two D CFT, uh, yeah, you're right. When, when CL is not a, a CL minus CR must be zero to to have uh, whatever interface. So maybe yeah, what you say is right that you ha uh, the yeah. So so probably it's true that uh, there is no boundary condition in some sense of of uh, all fermion electrodynamics, uh, but I, but I can't prove it. So I yeah, maybe let's discuss later. I, I want to ask ask your you guys' opinion about it. Actually, there is a simple argument that uh, the all fermion uh, QED. Uh, have a non-trivial bulk, which is W to W3. Yeah, no, I, and, I agree, I agree. But if, uh, if, if you have a boundary to a trivial phase, the trivial phase will have a bulk, which is a trivial. And so, I, I, so that's, I, that's basically means uh, this in, that's a contradiction. And uh, because the boundary uniquely determine the bulk. And uh, I, I, so, so, I there's a, so, so there's a very simple kind of, Maybe hand waving some of the information. Yeah, I was trying to avoid that argument. Okay. But but I, I totally agree with you. Anyway, anyway, so, sorry. So is that, that, that was a deep word. So I, I keep talking about local tensor factorization, but I actually haven't given a concrete construction or definition of the local tensor factorization in continuum theories. Um, uh, this was not a big problem. We just used the fact that taking the partial trace of the region A bar, um, a, uh, does not affect what happens in region A during infinitesimal Euclidean evolution, except at the boundary. Uh, so I will still show you how to think about this in a more rigorous way, rigorous way in the following, uh, the, uh, think about the tensor factorization, and it'll then be clear that even when the tensor factorization exists, it is actually non-unique. As Simeon already said it, uh, yeah, tensor factorization, the, the way you tensor factorize a uh, De uh, defines the boundary condition. And we will see that there are actually infinite choices from the coefficients of relevant operators. So let's go to the definition of local tensor factorization. So we, we, we've been talking about an equality like H is equal to HA tensor HB. Uh, I, I stopped using A bar, but we will define local tensor factorization using a map like this. H going to H, H A tensor HB. 
And the reduced density matrix should be defined if you want to be accurate as, uh, because uh, M rho M dagger. M dagger um, uh, uh, maps HA tensor HB to H, and rho is a map from H to H, and M is a map from H to HA tensor HB. So, so then you can be uh, uh, accurately take the partial trace like this. And you by using the uh, cyclicity of the trace, you, you, you can say that partial density, uh, reduced density matrix is defined by the partial trace of M dagger M times rho. And we call this the factorization operator. This is an operator uh, which maps from Hilbert space H to Hilbert space H. And this has physical effect on the computation of the reduced density matrix because you uh, literally modify, uh, you ritual, literally modify the density matrix. Anyway, modifying rho to F, uh, factorization map times rho is a way of regulating the tensor factorization actually. And the, but the effect of the modification should be as local as possible. If we were interested in the original density matrix, uh, it, it, we don't want f of m to introduce any artificial um, correlation, long long range correlations. And non-local operators would introduce artificial and wanted correlations between subsystems. Uh, again, H A is the map defined around here, and uh, if it's not local, it's gonna uh, induce entanglement and want an artificial entanglement from the definition of it. And so was to keep everything, but but we have to keep everything finite. We we really want it to be as accurate as possible, so we have to keep everything finite. We cannot take it completely local though. We need to introduce a scale epsilon f factorization scale so that f of m is local up to that scale. So I'm saying that f of m introduces a, a, a correlation of order epsilon f, and we uh, we allow that. But for, for example, it, um, so, so if, if, if the region A is defined to be an interval, we don't allow f of m to correlate between the two sides like this of the order of the uh, geometry itself. So, so, so you, you in, in, intrinsically need a scale, intrinsic scale, epsilon f. And this is one way to understand the origin of UV dependence of the entanglement entropy. I mean, as you, you always, you, 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 you always say that the entanglement entropy is like uh, proportional to log L over epsilon, and the epsilon uh, cannot be of, uh, decoupled from the uh, from the computation. And so this is why you need epsilon uh, here. Uh, so so uh, I, I've been very abstract, but uh, there is one uh, useful construction of the factorization map I like. Um, uh, we the factorization map is an almost local operator which uh, introduces correlation of order epsilon f, uh, which is generally an infinite sum of local operators whose coefficients depend on epsilon f, but one class of such examples can be constructed using boundary conditions. I mean, but one, one defines it using the a path integral. One cuts out a whole of size epsilon f like this around an entangling point. This is the entangling point, region A, region B, right? And place a boundary condition over this circle, on the circle. And uh, in order to have the boundary condition, it is necessary uh, to have CLs equal to CR to have boundary conditions, whatever, whatsoever. Right. So, so I mean, I mean, uh, if M is defined as the partial, uh, sorry, path integral over the green region, and the, the evolution up to T equals zero is M dagger, and this is M. Okay. So uh, uh, M dagger. Or maybe I, I so. okay. So this is how you define the factorization map. Uh, by by by, I mean, if M uh, bring brings the state to a factorized state. Anyway, so so again, one could set a whole size of epsilon f around the entangling point and place a boundary condition on the circle and do a path integral. Uh, so, and the factorization map can be constructed as a path integral on a strip, again, with a boundary conditional on the circle. Uh, again, I, I've been keep, I, I keep saying it, but uh, it's a path integral over this green region. And you take epsilon f to zero, and the boundary condition flows to conform boundary condition. Okay. I mean, in the IR. Uh, again, assuming the freedom connection hypothesis, yeah, because it's, it's never been proven, but, uh, you know, we believe so, I guess. 
So, 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 so for, in, order to, in, in order to see that it's concrete enough, let's uh, compute the in, radiant entanglement entropy using this definition of the factorization map and the tensor factorization and all that. Uh, <clears throat> again, notice that the definition of tensor factorization define the boundary condition. Uh, so, so that's, that's, that's a very important point. Right, so you choose a boundary condition once you take, uh, once you take a specific partial trace. Uh, <clears throat> so, so let's say, let's see, we can compute nth ready entropy, entanglement entropy of an interval of length L using this formalism. Uh, so the replica manifold of an interval looks like the following. So you have a branch cut here. Uh, I mean, interval, in, this is the interval A and the complement is called B and the path integral will look like this. And uh, because it's the nth Rennie entropy, you have n branch cut, nth, n, you know, nth branch cut here. So after conformal transformation, uh, <clears throat> by which I mean, uh, take this to be a spatial slice and uh, do a tr conformal transformation like this, right? So this maps to a cylinder, simply a cylinder, and this is the uh, branch cut. So what, what, what happens is that after conformal transformation, this geometry maps to a cylinder of radius two pi n times epsilon f, because epsilon f was the radius of the uh, hole with length as some complicated function. And you already observe a uh, log L over epsilon f here. So it's really a good sign. Um, so, but the nth Rennie entropy is defined like, uh, the uh, Sn is equal to, yeah, some, something like uh, log of Zn over Z1 to the n. By Zn, I mean, it's the partition, nth replica, uh, partition function of the nth replica manifold. Z1 is the partition function of the geometry itself. Uh, so let's only concentrate on Zn, the partition function of replica manifold, which is, again, a cylinder of uh, length L and of circumference to pi n epsilon f. Right. Epsilon f is a factorization scale again. And uh, Zn, because it's a, a cylinder, can be computed using boundary state formalism because it's a CFT and uh, you, you attach boundary uh, state here and there. And uh, <coughs> you have, it's the um, Euclidean time evolution. It's the Euclidean time evolution of the uh, closed channel, Hamiltonian. and uh, so, so, so I mean, but by, by, by I mean, uh, it's the over uh, something like uh, n uh, epsilon f or something, like or something, uh, right? So, so it's it's how it's a it's a formula for uh, extracting the z uh, partition function of the nth replica manifold, which is just a cylinder. And you can you, you can extract it using boundary state formalism, but by using the closed closed channel Hamiltonian. By closed channel, I mean this is the direction of time. Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> but uh, by by uh, by writing down all, everything using boundary state formalism, we can get the actual result by inserting this set inside the bracket. Uh, complete set, I mean this and this inside the bracket, and. Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, I, I, I think I, I yeah, uh, by, by, by inserting the complete basis inside the bracket, one can uh, actually compute it. And uh, the, the summation means that there are non-zero contributions from all, from all, the, all the operators coupling to the boundary condition. Okay, but because this, these are non-zero. So anyway, the final result will look like this. Uh, the entropy is some a very well-known formula. Uh, I mean, C over six times log L over epsilon UV scale plus some boundary entropy plus correction that goes like this. Uh, L over epsilon F to the something comes from this portion with unknown coefficients coming from, uh, you know, the, these boundary uh, boundary uh, conditions. The leading order reproduces the known result, but it's, you can see that it has many, if, uh, infinitely many corrections. 
On truncating the series, the leading order corresponds to replacing the boundary conditions with twist operators. So uh, I, I, I assume you all know it, but uh, uh, in defining the uh, entanglement entropy, you, what you usually do is to insert the twist operator of the entangling point and compute the two-point function. And uh, this is um, reproduced by the leading order result, but it's actually not correct. Um, the truncation is good only if n is much, the replica index is much less than log L. So <coughs> over epsilon f. Uh, so the, the familiar twist operator formalism uh, uh, of, of, of computing the Rayleigh entropy fails when the replica index is large enough. Uh, again, one can see the inconsistency of the truncation as follows. Like uh, uh, all the intricate inf information about factorization hides at large ready index. That's that's why we looked at large n, large ready index. Be <clears throat> because at large n, one can see that the twist operator prescription uh, breaks down. I mean, this can be seen by expanding the two point function of twist operators, which we think of as the entanglement entropy, uh, sorry, uh, ready entropy. But because it's the two-point function in, in a CFT, it scales like uh, the length uh, two n minus one over n. Uh, uh, n minus one over n is the weight of the twist operator and expand it at large n, one over n expansion. And then you will get the uh, subleading uh, correction to the formula, okay? But this cannot be interpreted as entanglement spectrum. Entanglement spectrum must be a, a trace of some uh, some 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 matrix to the n, right? So it should be a sum of some up, some some number to the n uh, summed up. Uh, so but by by assuming lambda zero is greater than lambda one dot dot dot, we can we can see that at large n the subleading correction goes like uh, lambda one over lambda zero to the n, which is totally different from the uh, expectation from the twist operator computation. So you can you can see that the, the computation of the entanglement entropy people usually do uh, is uh, actually fails when the ready index is large enough. Uh, this is actually not my result. It's already, um, it was already found out by Cardi in 2010. Okay. Any, any, any questions so far? No, okay. Conclusions. So conclusions, one cannot have a tensor factorization of the Hilbert space in 2D CF, uh, QFTs with a gravitational anomaly. I say QFT because, you know, anomaly is toofed. Uh, I mean, toofed anomaly is invariant under RG flow. So, and this cannot be cured by any procedures which keep intact the law physics of original theory. And it's also related to the lattice realizability of continuum theories. Uh, generalizations to four and six dimensions are possible. Uh, I mentioned it. And even when the tensor factorization exists, as we saw uh, uh, for, the, for the last couple of uh, uh, minutes, which we, sh we should also be careful about its non-uniqueness coming from the boundary conditions. How, how do you take the boundary conditions? Um, gravitational anomaly turned out to be the most crude consistency condition imposed by quantum information, imposed by quantum information theory, right? Because for example, uh, what's the, what's the Ryuta Kanagi formula for the um, anomalous theory? Okay. Uh, also, what's the odd dimensional generalization of this in terms of both the Hilbert space factorization or the lattice constructions? Is, is there any a three dimensional theories uh, uh, which does not admit lattice constructions uh, uh, per se, in the sense of Nielsen and Nomia. Uh, that's my question too. And uh, <clears throat> uh, so, so uh, one one gets a lot from considering the large replica index because uh, n goes to one, uh, the ordinary for Neumann, for Neumann entropy. Uh, this does not tell us about UV consistency of the quantum gravity a lot. So we should look, actually look at the large replica index. That's the whole new regime we should be studying. Uh, where such information is, is presumably hiding as a form of the resolution of the Obifold point. So we talk, uh, people talk about uh, the dual of boundary condition uh, uh, in, in gravity theory is end of the world brain or something like that. But we're not sure, really sure what, how that would be realized. 
in string theory, for example. So that's going to give you the consistency condition for the quantum gravity. Uh, and maybe one should probably study entanglement entropy in string theory, maybe, maybe starting from topological strings, because, you know, if one is interested in such a resolution. Also, the island con conjecture, a uh, uh, computation that shows us the non-universality of entanglement does not manifest itself at any n is equal to one plus epsilon. So uh, maybe because you get all the semi-classical results. And where does the non-universality first show up? At order epsilon square, at finite n, or only at infinite n. So that's that's the next thing we're going to be thinking about. Yeah. <clears throat> also, uh, very, very, also a very simple question: What does Yutokanagi formula mean for gravitational anomalous theory, which can be realized holographically? Uh, I mean, gravitational anomalous theory can be realized holographically, but I said entanglement entropy does not exist for such a theory. But we can compute the minimal area in such a theory too. So, what does this mean? Maybe today's argument indicates that any holographic two-dimensional CFTs must have anomaly much less than the total central charge to make sense of the RT formula, at least at the classical level. And there, there are no counterexamples to this statement. Uh, and uh, maybe we can prove this using bootstrap. Um, right. Uh, uh, also, some people claim that uh, axiomatic QFT can define relative entropy, even for gravitationally anomalous theories. And uh, they compute the relative entropy of a free chiral fermion uh, and what that would mean. That, uh, it's also the question, and the final question would be uh, <coughs> entanglement entropy should match cross duality, uh, but this will require careful treatment of the boundary condition. So it'd be interesting to uh, work out the duality map of the boundary condition, which has been uh, done somewhat by, uh, uh, what? This is, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot the name. So some, some people already, but I, I think it's interesting, even in this context, uh, sorry, in the context of quantum information to study the uh, duality map between boundary conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, question for Mastaka. Yeah, I, I have one, which is, one way that we, you know, sometimes think about these theories with non-vanishing central charge is that, well, you shouldn't really think of it as a one plus one dimensional theory, but you should think of it as something that necessarily lives at the boundary of a two plus one dimensional bulk. And so, you know, certainly we can write down a lattice model of a churn insulator. And, and so once you have the bulk theory, um, it seems like you can partition the Hilbert space in this way and calculate entanglement and so on. Um, can you comment on how that relates to your result? Yes, 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 I will. That's a very uh, good question. I, I, I want to add a page to it. <laughs> Do you know how to, no, you, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, I, I'll do it here, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, right, so first of all, uh, it, it, you're totally right. So you can, you can, you can, you can attach the 3D ball to the 2D uh, anomalous theory to uh, do the lattice, lattice factorization, that's true. Uh, and you can, but the, not the boundary condition. So, so imagine a topological, uh, what, uh, super, uh, I don't know how to call it. So, so okay, it's a 3D ball, right? And it's the, uh, our 2D anomalous theory. Uh, is living on the edge of it, right? We want to we want to cut it in half. So obviously, we're going to have a, a, a this portion. Mm -hmm. So it's not really it's not re really what we want to do to uh, to to play. Uh, it's not really placing the boundary condition. It's actually what Shaogan uh, mentioned uh, to be that uh, a boundary of a boundary is zero argument. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, if you, yeah, that's, it's true that you can start from, it's probably true that you can define so, some so, sort of, yeah, so, sorry, go, go on, go on, sorry. So, so are you saying that, you know, the fact that we can do this when we have the three bulk and make this partition, you know, and there's no kind of obstruction to partition the Hilbert space, you're saying, 
I think what you what you are saying is that doesn't mean that we can solve the problem just for the 2D anomalous theory by itself. Is that okay. no, is that what you're saying or or No, no, okay. So what uh, what I meant was that uh, if you assume that the finite boundary entropy because you have you have uh, uh, so so if you do, if you don't want to have infinite boundary entropy uh, when you partition the uh, system into two parts, you can't do that for the anomalous theory. If you allow infinite boundary, uh, sorry, infinite boundary entropy, you can do, do something like this. Uh -huh. you, your edge modes lives here and uh, it's one dimensional higher. So uh, there, uh, there are infinite entropy here. So the implicit assumption is that you don't have infinite boundary entropy. And uh, but the reason why we did not allow infinite boundary entropy is that um, having infinite boundary entropy uh, um, uh, breaks the uh, correlation, uh, breaks, I mean, contaminates the um, correlation of the original density matrix by, by having infinite modes near the edge. Okay, and, and you're saying that, that basically comes from the, from the area law of the bulk theory. That if you try to collapse all of that entropy onto the boundary, if right. the bulk is okay, right? And the, yeah, right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, there was a yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So so yeah, I was reading the chat, and uh, I, I think yeah, I think it's right. Yeah, so I kind of agree with Ryan. Uh, no, I mean, what I want, what I meant, what I said, I want to do, uh, I want to do something like this. I, I mean, uh, define all fermion QD without depending on 5D bulk and see if it can um, support boundary condition or even lattice construction without using the 5D bulk. That's what I meant. So, but, but for, that, for that case, I mean, there's no, there's no pure gravitational anomaly in, in four. Oh, oh no, 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 there oh, is. A, a, glo a global, yeah, that's right. Global. Yeah, that's right, that's right. right. So that's what I want to know. I, I mean, I, I don't even understand a simpler question of um, if there are any, uh, obstruction to uh, lattice realizability in three dimensions where you don't have really, you, you really don't have gravitational anomaly, but uh, you have global anomaly, much, a bunch of global anomalies. Yeah, it's a subtle question, right? Like the way we understand the W2, W3 anomaly is like the theory is not diffeomorphism invariant on CP2. Right. But what does a lattice model have anything to do with defining the theory on CP2, right? Right. Yeah. That's what I'm interested in. Although I don't really have the power to do it by myself. So I'm asking around. Right. Now. I do think that like, if you, if you want to define the theory on CP2, then maybe you can rule out a boundary condition because mm. you can say something like in the presence of this boundary, you can connect the diffeomorphism to the identity, right? Like you, you hollow out some ball from CP2 and you put the boundary condition on it, then, okay, I'm not exactly sure, but maybe the mapping class group, once you have a boundary is trivial so that this non-trivial diffeomorphism that's not connected to the identity is maybe now connected to the identity when you have mm. a boundary. And then nice. maybe you can argue that you know, this phase in the partition function that you pick up when you perform this diffeomorphism, maybe you can argue that that's local, that it should still be there once you have the, the boundary condition in some part of the manifold, you know, maybe where you have it act by the identity in some big region, because you can do that. And now you unwind it in the phase, uh, you know, you have to go through some kind of sign change maybe. I see. I see. I'm not, I, see. I can kind of imagine an argument, but there, more generally, there are global gravitational anomalies that maybe have nothing to do with diffeomorphisms. Mm -hmm. Like I know a time reversal in the three plus one dimension yeah. 
it's some, it can be very subtle, right? Right. I mean, for example, like uh, 3D John Simon's theory, uh, I think there is a lattice regularization, a lattice regularization of it, but it's anomalous, a, 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 right? A time reversal anomalous. So, uh, so is there a lattice regularization of, of 3D Chern Simons? I've, I've never found a, a straight I, answer to this question. But, but I think people, yeah, okay. I don't think we have one, but we have one for some situations, like Kataev honeycomb model gives rise to a, a chiral theory. But if, you, if you're going to include a symmetry, then you can have the condition that maybe you want the symmetry to be on-site. Mm. If you don't have that condition, then the anomaly is not a obstruction in general. But what's the T anomaly mean? What, what does the T anomaly mean then? Uh, what's the on-site T anomaly? Oh, I'm just saying if... Okay, so I don't know how to prove it for anti-unitary symmetries like time reversal, but... For unitary symmetries, I think you can argue that if you have an on-site action, then there's no anomaly, basically because there's a, a apparent way in the lattice model to gauge the symmetry where everything is going to be consistent. Mm -hmm. But if it's not on-site, it's not even clear how to begin to gauge it in the lattice picture. I see. So examples in in two dimensions, you can have uh, you can have finite chiral symmetries that don't act on site. Finite chiral symmetry. Uh, yeah. Like so Z8. They, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I see, I see. That, that Z two symmetry can be like a not on site symmetry. But, uh, I see, I see, I see, true, true, true. I see, I see. I didn't want to <laughs> say that the whole U1 maybe can be made because I think that's going to be a lot more non-local, but if you want to have like a like a circuit or something, you know, something that's almost on-site, hmm. it's still made from local unitary operators, then you definitely create examples of anomalous symmetries on the lattice. <laughs> But then when you study boundary conditions, it's interesting. Like if you have a lattice model, you can of course like truncate it at the boundary. And, uh, but if you, if your symmetry is not on site, it's not clear how to define the symmetry action at the edge. Right, 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 right. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be so, very good to understand the global gravitational part better. That was really the missing part in, uh, our work with UFAN as well. We had to do yeah. that result. It's a, it's, a, it's a difficult question, I think. Yeah. Right. Anything else? Like, Any any quantum gravity related question? <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Yeah, actually, actually like, um, can you explain a bit more some of the quantum gravity applications of this? Because I really don't know. Okay, I, I yeah no, uh, I, I can't say I'm a hundred percent expert on this. I've never written a paper about uh, about it, but but but. So, so, like, so it, it, it's a it's a it's a trend in business these days to compute the uh, ent compute the phenomenon entropy of the radiation of an evaporating black hole, right? And then uh, uh, they successfully computed the uh, entropy profile, uh, uh, phenomenon entropy profile uh, uh, versus time using. Uh, Using uh, semi-classical gravity, using Ryu-Takanagi formula, sort of, and uh, 
they, they show that, that it goes back to zero when the uh, black hole has completely evaporated. It's not completely uh, precise, but bear with me. Uh, so so the, th this was the information paradox. The information paradox was that uh, it keeps growing forever. Uh, people thought that because people are forgetting one one other subtle of the gra gra gravitational theory, uh, people thought that it keeps going forever. But if you take into account all the correct subtles of the gravitational path integral, you can you, you can show that at the level of the von Neumann entropy, the information is retrieved. Uh, by, by which I mean the entropy uh, goes goes back entanglement ent uh, entropy goes back to zero after the evaporation. Entanglement entropy goes uh, goes back to zero, uh, but but it's not clear uh, what happens for uh, other Rennie entropies like uh, n equals to two, three, or four, and uh, it, it's particularly uh, puzzling because if you want if you consider higher uh, Rennie entropy, finite Rennie entropy, um, you have to um, when you compute the gravitational path integral, you have to consider like uh, wormhole configurations connecting two different uh, replica regions, and uh, that's it's kind of strange because um, you, you should if you if, if you think that's the rule of the gravitational path integral, um, if you compute the if you want to compute the um, partition function of two decoupled CFTs, you have to compute you, you, you have to consider uh, the uh, gravitational um, uh, uh, subtle point connecting two decoupled CFTs, and uh, you, you, this will contribute so that um, the, the the result is not z squared. I mean, I mean because they're completely decoupled CFTs, uh, the result should be z squared, right? The partition function squared. But because of the subtle point like this. Uh, it deviates from this result, and it's it's strange. And people say that it's averaging that kills, uh, that creates such a configuration. Uh, cl uh, classical averaging. I mean, people say that the gravitational path integral only creates um, the classical average of the uh, of the uh, UV theory or something like that. Uh, and uh, so 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 in, anyway, what, what I'm trying to say is that. Uh, Although the information paradox has been partially solved for it equals one, the full Neumann entropy, uh, there is a whole unknown region when you go to a higher any entropies. And in particular, I believe that uh, uh, the large replica number might be might be a good region to study, start, start um, these type of uh, thinking because we, you, you clearly see boundary conditions uh, and uh, People don't really know what what's dual to the boundary condition like this. I mean, people say it's end of the role brain, but it's like conceptual, and uh, uh, it does not come from any UV. Um, it might not come from any UV uh, UV object, some some brain from um, string theory. So so yeah, so so th th that's what I'm thinking about. Hope it's clear enough, and I'm sorry if it's not clear. Oh, thanks for explaining. Can I naively ask, like, uh, I would have thought that you know the, these rainy entropies have many uh, much more mundane uh, pathological behaviors than uh, the information being fully retrieved from a black hole. So I wonder why people expect them to behave uh, as nicely. Uh, no, no, yeah, because of ADS-CFT, we believe that the information is fully retrieved after the ev evaporation of the black hole. I mean, after all the time evolution of the quantum gravity, we want it to be unitary, right? So that's why people believe that it's, I mean, it's it's like an oracle. It's, it, it's, it, it, it should tell us what's the, what's the consistency condition we have to have for the low energy gravity theory. Um, if, uh, if it ever comes from, the consistent quantum gravity theory. Oh, I see. So the, your point is that for a pure state, the Rennie entropies are also all zero. Yeah, right, right, right. I see. So I believe that would be the very interesting question, uh, to, to interesting direction to proceed.
recently, at least in um, Quantum Gravity, there's a uh, perspective that's been pushed by um, Carlo and his collaborators that says, um, like quantum gravity actually allows you to transition from white hole region to, uh, sorry, from black hole region to a white hole region. So like um, that sort of allows the boundary theory to not be unitary. Um, so like there's some chiral fermions that can actually transition through uh, to the other side of the black hole. Like um, he just says that, um, uh, I think his point is that uh, by taking the classical picture of uh, GR, where um, you know your your space time geometry just terminates at the horizon, that's not correct in the quantum theory. Um, that you should allow for the possibility of tunneling through into the into the other side of the white hole. So, um, yeah, I mean uh, the the fact that uh, you want to have a sort of like a holographic description of the um, of, of the theory on the horizon, um, if you force the um the uh, the i guess semi classical space time to sort of terminate at, at your horizon then you sort of have to have unitarity there right um because you know information can um you want information to be preserved but i guess like carlos uh, perspective allows for the possibility of um these chiral things coming in and out uh, so so I, I think it's all like uh, nor belief like, like I, guess, I guess, I guess, like uh, if we believe that it's unitary, uh, it's probably going to be going to have uh, a consistency in condition, and that might be interesting. Right. You know, and yeah. I guess that's the yeah. standpoint. I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's a very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Masataka. Yes. Uh, summarize the kind of questions for the summarizing the result. What's the most general claim, but also rigorous statement you can make? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Most rigorous statement that uh, you can make. Rigorous and ge general. I, I would say, I would just uh, say, I would just say that uh, you should not define, you should not try to define entanglement entropy for, uh, let's say, chiral fermion. <laughs> I, I would say that's the, that's the take home message. I mean, gravitationally, an almost theory cannot have entanglement entropy. That's the that's one general claim. But but that's not a problem for for these theory. So, which means your statement wasn't precise. No, no, no. no so, sorry, I, I I forgot to say two D, right? Okay. I mean, two D. Do do not do not try to define entanglement entropy in two D anomalous theory, uh, gravitationally anomalous theory. But 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 you have any? You maybe you made an attempt, but I didn't find a clear statement for higher dimension. Do you try to make any attempts? Uh, yeah yeah no no we 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 made some attempts and uh, okay in six D what we have proved is that. Uh, uh, I think I wrote it somewhere, right? Uh, no. Eh? Uh, uh, uh. But, mm, but, yeah. but maybe I can, let me say it for you. So are you just trying to say, if I have a system uh, with or capture the pure perturbative local gravitational anomaly, then we should not consider entanglement property or entanglement entropy of the system. And to compatible with some local tensor product like Hilbert space structure. Yes. Yes. Is that, but yeah. but this, this will be the take home message for me or for everyone. I just want to make sure whether I miss anything you want to convey. No, I think you're right. I think what you said was right. So, what I'm saying is that uh, again, uh, if you have gravitational, a pure local uh, perturbative gravitational anomaly, you can't define the boundary condition. And then that means that uh, you can't define the entanglement entropy because you can't factorize the Hilbert space. Okay, thank you. Okay, maybe we can thank uh, Masataka for the uh, nice seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much.